As we begin this question and answer session, we certainly invite the full range of perspectives that are represented in this room from students at the university here preparing to be educators to the, those that work in the schools and to, uh, to those that work here in the university in teacher preparation and educator preparation. I invite you to bring uh, questions forward then to uh, ask uh, of our panelists. I'd like to um, to begin in a in a, in a way, uh, in a sense, to ask them to provide somewhat of a summary statement of their message, and and maybe they could do that in in a reaction to a statement that's been very useful and and powerful for us uh, within the the BYU Public School Partnership, and that's a, a well-known observation that Tokyo made. Uh, many years ago about uh, our democracy, our life here in America. And I'll, I'll read this quote and then ask each of the three panelists, our speakers here, to respond maybe within something that uh, is, is within this quote, but as it relates to their primary message, because I think the messages that we heard today are, are contained or uh, at least have a relationship to some point that uh, de Tocqueville made in the past. So his quote is this, in a republic, virtue may be defined as the love of the laws and of, and of our country. As such, love requires a constant prep, a, a constant preference of public to private interests. It is the source of all private virtue. Now a government is like everything else. To preserve it, we must love it. Everything therefore depends on establishing this love in a republic. And to inspire it ought to be the principal business of education. But the surest way of instilling it into children is for parents to set an example. So we'll start with President Holland and uh, move across. And if that's a, a jumping off spot sure. or connecting to your message, it would be appreciated. Let me just say, as they conclude this first, uh, this first opportunity to speak, then if you come down to this microphone to, uh, to offer up your, uh, your question or challenge to the panel, we'd appreciate it. And uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, so, uh, of course, I'm uh, one very sympathetic to uh, the whole, whole Tocquevillean understanding of the development of America and its the needs that uh, the things it needs to turn to for public health and uh, and that those things are connected to issues that go beyond something that, um, as I tried to convey in my remarks have become for many people sort of standard interpretation of American public life, which is the following, that uh, in a way that went against uh, some of our pre-modern and ancient ways of looking at the world, uh, the founder stepped forward to say in many respects that uh, the way that we can best live together is to actually not be quite as worried about one another as a community, that, that what was first and foremost the, the, the foundation of our political order was a sense of individual rights so that people could freely choose to live for themselves how they wanted to. And that this was a very helpful um, corrective, if you will, to older ways of gathering together in a social order that tended to be religious and moral and tapping into a, a fine high western tradition. But weren't always so good when it came to recognizing individual freedoms. And, uh, and that, that was a good thing, but in, in moving that direction, it has been taken too far. And that there is a sense that only by thinking about individual rights and individual liberty and the pursuit of individual happiness can we forge a common life together. And I think that's just patently false. And that we do have to look to things outside of ourselves, to other people, to higher principles, to supplement and correct 
the way that, uh, that we will associate with one another. And those resources don't come from a, just a pure doctrine of, of individual <coughs> rights and liberty. And they come from religion, they come from civic awareness, they come from parental example, they come from the practice of our individual moral conscious life, and they come from a whole array of things, and I have argued one, one of them being uh, a Judeo-Christian tradition that teaches the importance of a genuine concern for other people. So my statement goes a little beyond Tocqueville's. Tocqueville, if you listen carefully at the beginning, is just about love for the laws and, and, uh, and the, the, the communal good, if you will. But, uh, but I argue even that is dependent on, on something higher, ultimately. Um, trying to speak for my friend. Uh, whose position I, gen I endorse almost without exception, but I think if Dan were here, he, he, would, he would heartily endorse that perspective from Tocqueville. But I think he would say something about love and what kind of love one might have for the Republic and so forth. And, and he would be, I, I think he would endorse heartily what President Holland said that uh, our virtue is taught by the polis, by the whole network, by the whole society. I mean, it, it, you literally do have to float all the ethical boats at once, all the moral boats, all the institutions. It, it has to pervade everything that we do if, if that is going to, 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 to happen. If that love of law, if that, that uh, fellowship in society, it, it, it all has to happen. And then we have to love not only the laws, but we have to love what is good, what is worthy of being loved. I think if he were here, he would say something like, we toss that word around a little bit too freely. Uh, I know, for example, just speaking interculturally for a minute, I don't think a single Spanish speaker in here would ever use a, a phrase that would translate directly, I really love those shoes. Okay, <laughs> that we give our love too freely and it becomes sort of a superficial emotion. There's something that has to go down deep with the quality of what is good and what is right and what is true and, and that about our culture, about the founding, about education. And that's one thing that education has to teach us, that which is worthy of our love and our deepest uh, <coughs> commitment, our self-defining relationship which is why we met uh, Odysseus and Penelope in Dan's paper. That kind of love is, is what we have to foster. And the teaching of the best and the, uh, uh, that we have will do that, and that's how what we most care about will be preserved. In the quote that Paul offered, he brought up the issue of parental example, so I was thinking maybe I ought to make a statement that would address past, present, and future. Um, and, and I think it, was, it would go like this. Consider that every act in the present moment is an act for or against both the previous and the next generation. So that in understanding where we came from and understanding we're sowing seeds of where we're going and where our descendants will go, we are always thinking of more than ourselves in the way we undertake uh, the, the challenges of life and to meet the circumstances that we are in. An additional comment then that would talk about the present moment is we must do right by ourselves and others if our mutual best interests are to be realized. And in acknowledging that, we, we might very well bring forward from the past the best from our ancestors while shedding the worst and behaving in a way that makes the, the, the possibilities of peace, hope, and success of the next generation better even than whatever ours might have been. And for those folks who, who feel they came from negative or destructive backgrounds, um, you become a transition figure. You become a person who really, really does shed the worst of the past and really, really does, does set the stage for, for the best for, for the future. When we were doing our work in adolescent pregnancy, we were in a lot of federal meetings and as people looked at our material, we, we got a variety of disbelieving comments from time to time. One of them was, 
Oh, you people really have a positive view of human beings, don't you? Well, yes, but it's not a naive view. It's a view that considers the possibility that tomorrow can be better than today according to the quality of life we are living. Another comment we got was, well, this seems to be okay for people that are successful and people that have successful families, but what about people that have been in, in uh, desperate circumstances? So we weren't expecting that question, by the way, but our off-the-cuff answer, fortunately, there were three of us involved in the primary work, uh, well, four actually, but, but what we were able to say is, well, let's see, we won't tell you who this is, but one of us saw his father commit suicide with a shotgun when he was very young. Another had the father abandon the family, and it took the son 15 years to track down where the father had disappeared to. And the third one lost a father in wartime and, and was raised alone and in a, in a home with a toxic stepfather. I, I say three, there were four. We had a, a fourth person who, uh, whose par parents, parents were both immersed in alcoholism. That's enough to say, I guess. But here's the point that we made by revealing all that is don't disqualify the value or the possibility of people just because they're yesterdays might not have been ideal. Uh, the present moment is our best opportunity, and that's why we would claim it's possible to act in our own and others' best interest in the present moment, and that is enhanced when we pay attention to what the best was from the past, no matter how much bad there was, and by acknowledging that we can contribute to the best in the future if we are willing to do so. Questions? Microphone, and that, that will be helpful for the audience to hear. I direct this especially to Terry Olson. When you're helping the students with intimate stories they're thinking about or recounting with their uh, closest friends or family, aren't you trying to ultimately help them get to the idea of universal human dignity? That if they care about their mother, how would they then care about a stranger? And maybe another question would be, have you ever asked them, if I had the opportunity to acquire a lot of money and no one would ever know I stole that money, why would I not take the opportunity? Anyway, there's a couple questions. One of our teachers, we, we don't, We think that the general use of moral dilemmas in moral education, generally speaking now, is unfortunate and maybe even wrong-headed in two ways. One, the dilemmas are contrived, and that in, in itself is already a problem. We would prefer real-life situations to be real-life situations. It's not that a contrived dilemma is inherently unfortunate, but it often is, and it often is because of the second problem with contrived dilemmas, and that is that you typically restrict the free choice, free ethical moral choices of the students you're handing the dilemma to, instead of letting it be totally open to what their own being true to conscience would suggest to them. So whether, you know, in terms of what to do with stolen money or whatever, we, we want to leave that open to the students um, and, and not to dictate it. Uh, I mean, the classic dilemmas are falling out of favor somewhat by Kohlberg's descendants, not, not completely. But you've all heard them. You've all, you've all heard the lifeboat dilemma, where the boat sank or the plane crashed, and there are eight of you on a raft, and there's only enough food and water to go around for five, and so you have to decide who to throw out. And, and uh, so, you know, there's an aging golf pro with tuberculosis, there's a pregnant teenager, there's a, uh, you, know, that, you know how it goes. Um, we had a 15-year-old come up and we were guesting in a class for the teachers we were training and somehow the issue of dilemmas had come up and she said, yeah, you know, last, last semester I had been given a dilemma. I, she'd been given the lifeboat dilemma, which again I think is fading from the educational scene, I hope. <laughs> uh, but she had been given it and she went to the teacher and said, you know, um, fr frankly, th if I were in that situation, I, I, my first moral thought is I wouldn't want to throw anybody out of the boat. I would rather wait and see what tomorrow will bring, and we'll just give our best together. And the teacher said, here's my example of restricting the choices. 
no, no, you've got to figure out which three you're going to throw out of the boat because we've got to see how you would reason about that. Now, the 15-year-old wasn't, you know, astute enough to say, oh, in other words, I've got to reason out my way out of an immoral act that I don't believe is right, <laughs> take an innocent life so that I can preserve my own. Uh, I mean, she didn't, but anyway, she, she saw enough, and so she went ahead and went through this thing, but at the end, you know, preserve her integrity on the sheet, she wrote, but the real, my real decision, realistic, my real decision would have been I wouldn't have thrown anybody out of the boat because to me the moral issue here is not whether I live or whether I die, but how I live and how I die. Wisdom from a 15-year-old who's almost supposed to not be able developmentally to see that, that wisely. Um, so there's my, there's my starting point. <coughs> oh, one more thing. We were concerned about disclosure. That's where I thought you were going at first with your question. We, 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 tried, we warned the students in advance, and most of the time this worked just well. We said, <clears throat> when you give us examples, we don't want you to give examples that are extreme or lurid or are so, uh, are the, of the stuff of which ought not to be disclosed in the public domain. We're, we're looking for everyday life examples anyway, so you don't have to have anything, you know, huge or dramatic that changed your life or anything. We want everyday life stuff that it's okay if, you're, if you're, your co colleagues here in the class hear that and they're, they're not, there's nothing sufficient in them to tease you in the, in the lunchroom or whatever. So, yeah, we tried to, to limit the disclosure anyway by saying there are many examples in your own life but we don't have to know about them. Give us the ones that we can all relate to and that will, be, that will teach us something about how to go about our business. Uh, Dr. Olson seemed fairly uh, optimistic on the individual's futures and societies. But in the other two, uh, the point was made, I think, Professor Robinson, aside from going back to ancient Greece, said, you know, the founding fathers, here's the pinnacle of, of putting these practices and principles uh, in place and having this perfect opportunity to do so with a civic society. And uh, President Holland, you talked about, you know, that relative getting it right in Massachusetts just happened to be at that point. But that, that idea of us not knowing what, how good it, we have it and letting it slip through our fingers, is it too late? Is, it, is there an optimistic future for the country or can we just make do the best we can at this point? Uh, no, I don't think it's too late. Um, and, you know, it's an, the whole nature, the whole, the whole notion of a view of human nature embedded in the founding is an interesting one because on one hand, there's enough optimism to say we really can do this, uh, unlike something that's ever been done in the history of the world before. We can live together as equals and talk and argue and reason for ourselves, and with the help of a little structure, we can make it work. And yet, um, when you dig into it, you also see that um, implicit in the structures that are created is a, is a somewhat pessimistic view of human nature. The founders are just believed that we would basically be sort of self-interested cretins much of the time and we couldn't trust any one person with uh, power and we would have to always be in a check and balance against that so uh, I made reference to the election of 1800 we complain about politics today not nearly as nasty as that election of 1800 in some ways we're more civil than we were back then and certainly we're more civil today despite all of the problems that we face, all of the disagreement. We talk about this growing divide in the country. We're not shooting at each other like we were in 1860. So we do forget how bad things were in the past too. And so I, I look at America and its resources and there's a reason to be genuinely concerned and really worried about trends and what's happening to the moral and cultural climate around us and yet I still see that there is a lot there to suggest that we're going to stay stable, we're going to, we can, we can live to see another day. Um, uh, there was a, if you're really looking for hope in all this, I might recommend to this crowd a uh, talk that Elder Dallin A. Chokes gave at, at UVU a few uh, months ago as part of our Center for Constitutional Studies where he talked about hope for a future age. And even as we may look at some sort of cataclysmic events in the natural or moral world, uh, we shouldn't as assume that that leads to extinction, but uh, that sometimes those things add to a, 
a reboot and a reflowering. Uh, that the great books and the great ideas are great because they're permanent, they're true, and they will continue to reach back out to us. And maybe things have to get worse before they get better, but I still think there's absolutely reason for hope for the future. Um, again, I'll be a little, my consciousness will be divided here, but uh, um, Dan is as Dan is as charming as uh, a pessimist as you'll ever meet. So if, if he were here, he would be charmingly pessimistic about this. But I, I, at, the, at the foundation, I think there's a call for optimism. And, I, and, and if Dan were here, he would say, and he has said it before, if there's any place that you're optimistic, it's right here. Uh, the fact that you're here. And I'm optimistic because I think if, if we had a conversation with each one of you, you know what has to be done. It's not rocket science. You know what has to be done. I, to, to me, the, 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 the real issue is not can we do it, are we too far gone? It's do we have the moral fortitude and the intellectual firepower. Are we going to be tough enough with ourselves? Are we going to be hard enough with ourselves to have the conversations that need to be had that no one wants to have? Uh, this, the, 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 the solution won't come with sound bites and slogans. And it won't come, if Dan were here, he'd say, with another round of kumbaya. <laughs> it, it won't come with just joining hands in very long stretches of people. We have to be serious and, and get down to, all right, well, how do we handle that? Yeah, I, thought, I thought the quote from uh, James Davis and Hunter was, was, we want to have morality without judgments of morality. We, we want to have everybody get along without having to identify some things as right or wrong. So to me, the que and, and I'm very optimistic, and for the same reason Dan would be if he were here. But the question is, do we have the determination and, and what will it take to get that determination? And does it have to get better, worse before it gets better? To have the conversations that need to be had on this topic. I've, in my own career, I've tried to make a point of raising issues everybody wishes I wouldn't, civilly, with love, with friendship, with compassion, but unflinching. And how well I've done that, I don't know. Dan would certainly be exhibit A. But that's what we need to learn to do, is, is to have those conversations out of love, concern, charity, and civility that need to be had to address the source of the problems. So that it doesn't, and that's why I think leaking away is the problem. It's not going to be. It's not going to fall apart, it's just going to leak away. And if we ever forget the questions, then we got real problems. We, we may not know the answers, but if we forget the questions, then we're in trouble. One of the things we asked our teachers to invite students to understand is that there are three major sources of our mortal, M-O-R-T-A-L, troubles about which we can do something. There are other things we cannot do a lot about, earthquakes, terrorist bullets, what have you. But the three main things that we can do something about are, are confronting our own ignorance by the pursuit of knowledge, confronting our own incompetence by pursuing skill building, and by confronting our moral resistance by being true to conscience. Now, it seems to me that civic preparation and engagement involves all three of those things. So the optimism comes from our willingness to not give up to quote Winston of the Churchill variety. And it also means that we, we know that, that, that the more knowledge we get, the more we're able to understand the issues, the more we understand something about civic government and the Constitution, for example, the more we understand the, the need for democracy to move forward when people live responsibly compared to when they don't. Uh, that's all the kind of knowledge that allows us to build skills in making arguments in public meetings, in explaining to people what the, what's at stake. So, so we need to replace ignorance with knowledge and incompetence with skill and moral resistance with being true to conscience. But 
we put being true to conscience first. We put giving up moral resistance first because if we don't give that up, then whatever knowledge and skills we do have will become weapons that we use against people instead of tools by which we move forward the democratic enterprise. Okay, uh, I seem to um, uh, gather from all of you that uh, central to your conceptions of civic virtue is uh, charity. And so I wanted to, I think I know what your personal feelings are, but um, in, in terms of um, conveying this virtue publicly, it seems to me like the Christian understanding of charity um, is dependent on uh, a love of God. And the New Testament teaches us that uh, we love, you know, the, the two great commandments, and we love Christ because he first loved us. And then we love our brother because we see in them another being that Christ loves. Christ has uh, not only died for my sins, but he's also died for, for this other person's sins. And that's what unites us as brothers under his fatherhood. Um, can we even hope to have a unity or a brotherhood or charity in our society without acknowledging our shared dependence on Jesus Christ? And how do we do that publicly? Oh, that's an easy one. <laughs> this is when it's like good to be a professor and not a practitioner. <laughs> you sort of spout off things that people should think about and then run back to your carol and <coughs> your folks in the classroom deal with it. Um, so that's a really hard question, and that's a great question. I'm glad it came up. Uh, and I, if I was already dragging on too long, or I might have brought it up myself. The kinds of things I was talking about, I'll, I'll admit, are very difficult to translate, especially in what I would you know, call the sort of public ed world. It, it's frankly easier in the higher ed world. I, I can, I, as a bona fide scholar, I can stand up and make the argument I just made as, a, as an argument. It's rooted in history and philosophy and ethics, and, and it's not always easy, and there are some, you know, I've taken some arrows as a scholar for pursuing something distinctly religious, but there is space for that. I do think it gets harder in, in public education. Uh, so a, a few thoughts about that. Of course, ultimately, in some ultimate, truest, highest sense, I, I think your summary is right that no, we, it will take ultimately, I'm speaking here in a BYU setting, and. Uh, from a, a conviction, LDS conviction that I have, I'll just be explicit about that, that ultimately uh, for true, you know, um, true uh, ideal human order, it will require an understanding that, uh, that we must love each other, but that love is dependent upon a prior love from God and the God of a father and the sacrifice of his son that makes even our capacity to love possible. That will ultimately someday have to be understood by everybody to live together as we really should live together. Meanwhile, uh, we, we can't say that, and I think one of the things that you know, is, is, was implicit in my remarks is that one of the things that's interesting about a Winthrop and a Jefferson and a Lincoln, these were statesmen. They were supremely attuned to, the, to their times, and they had to be Reg, uh, cognizant of that and, and, and sensitive to that and responsive to that and you will all have to do the same thing too. So what I'm advocating, even, even Lincoln's, uh, Lincoln never once mentions Christ in the second inaugural. He mentions God plenty but he never mentions Christ or Christianity ever. That was in my mind his attempt to take his message, his Christian message and make it as broad and accessible as possible. I don't think what you folks are facing today, uh, you can exactly duplicate <coughs> what Lincoln did. You'll have to find your own ways, your own purchase, your own language to do that in, a, in an increasingly pluralistic world where there's increasing concern about specific, sectarian, uh, highly, Christianized, highly Christianized ways of referring to things in the public sector. And that's just something I deal with all the time in, in, in my job, even at a public university. So uh, that will be the artis artisanship of it, the statesmanship of it, is to find ways to take something you believe and know to be true, uh, but, uh, but 
convey it, share it uh, in ways that are, are appropriate for public sector and spaces. And there's going to be no easy or magic template to that, um, except to say that one of the things that you can do is that there are there are texts out there. There is a history out there. There are without preaching, and that's not in in many ways what what we're we're, we're to be doing uh, in the classroom, but there are things that you can get students to engage with where they can start to teach themselves or at least have a set of intellectual resources that at some point when it is more appropriate, when there are, they are in spaces where there can be a more free-form argument or debate about these things, they're at least equipped with something that teaches them something other than a purely secularized, individualistic way of looking at the world around them. I, I don't think there's too much that needs to be added to that. I, I guess I would just say this is part, well, this issue that we've taken up <coughs> has to be done on various levels and various fronts all at once. I, I, wish, that we're, I wish it were easier than that. Um, I, I think President Holland is, is very wise in saying there are ways to tell the story of civic virtue and even charity in other languages. Uh, in my own work, for example, uh, whenever I want to talk about truth in an unflinching way, uh, instead of back from my own Mormon heritage, I, I go to Martin Heidegger, of all people, and that usually shuts up a lot of my critics. Uh, <laughs> one of the bastions of postmodern uh, thought. Um, and when I want to talk about the, in, the absolute importance of an eternal soul, I go to Plato because uh, that generates less heat and, and at least puts that in the discussion. And so I, I share that as, as a convicted Latter-day Saint that ultimately yeah, it does come from God. But what I, what I am more concerned about now is instead of allowing the discourse to put more and more and more things out of bounds in the classroom, in the district, in the public discourse, you know, we have to somehow find fora, forums in which we can say, no, let's at least talk about this. Let's talk about charity. Now, my charity flows from my understanding of human nature and my understanding of God. Now, given that uh, Pro Professor Olson can show us charity is an immutable fact of life, because everybody will tell you a, a story about charity, and if you don't like my explanation of it, you explain it. And let's just open the discourse and have all that in play in our public discourse. And that's not a fait accompli. That's part of the struggle. Is just a, a, and meanwhile, we make a comparative advantage case. We say, well, my understanding of charity is this and this and this, and it comes from that, and this is, this is what you get. How are you doing? And to legitimate the discourse. I mean, that we would talk about charity as victory won. Then we, we find ways of interacting with each other and on the various levels where we have to stretch and find room for conversation. It, it wasn't written on stone that thou shalt not discuss religion in public. It, this is a long line of human decisions that have that have introduced this and so if human decisions produced it human decisions can rectify it but we've got to be really good and really smart and really careful and unflinching and stubborn can i, can I, add, I just add one um one this is sort of going micro but um, i've done it and i think it lends itself nicely in the public ed setting one of the ways you can do this in this day and age is um, maybe less through certainly John Winthrop and Jefferson and Lincoln get easier, but who gets really easy is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, he's such a universally embraced figure by so many of the people that might otherwise be quick to challenge any you know, religious discussion in a classroom, but all you have to do is show and now you've got in this digital age uh, and, and this kind of viewing age of our young students, you've got the I Have a Dream speech, which is civic charity, uh, you know, class, uh, class A. I mean, he, he consciously stands in front of the Lincoln Memorial. 
so that he can wrap himself in the language and the rhetoric of Lincoln and does just what Lincoln does in many respects, which is draws upon the Declaration, draws upon the Gettysburg Address, draws upon Christianity and themes to say, we've got a problem in this country. We're going to solve it actually not by hate and animosity, but by love and forgiveness. And through that love and f forgiveness, we'll find a greater degree of freedom. So that's just, again, one specific micro strategy of something that, at least in this day and age, tends to pass muster with a lot of people who otherwise might be skittish about these kinds of discussions. I graduated from a high school in Albuquerque, New Mexico in a year before 72.5% of you were even born. And, and it was, had a student body of over 2,000. There were 15 Jews, eight Mormons, many, many Protestants, and a whole raft of Catholics. But the social context of religion in that era was to not take offense at somebody else's religious beliefs, but to be respectful of them. Where have all the respectful flowers gone in the public domain regarding that, that very issue? With our teachers, and, and more from professionals than others in, in, our, in our work, but sometimes from students, we got this question. Sometimes it was asked sympathetically, Sometimes it was asked challengingly, if not hostily, okay? The question, of course, was, are you just teaching what Jesus taught, <laughs> okay? As if, as if there was a corner on charity, which President Holland has indicated is, is and, and Dan Robinson has indicated, <clears throat> it goes way, way back, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and yet, in, in its current, uh, permutation or whatever you want to say, and, and acknowledging Habermas's, from, from Dan Robinson's talk, acknowledging Habermas's atheist background, acknowledging, acknowledging or admitting that uh, a Christian tradition is what has helped save cultures, I'm maybe overstating it, but uh, given all that, and yet to continue the micro moment that President Holland indicated, people would often ask us, you talk about having a moral feeling and then being true or being able to live true or false to it. And yes, I've had those feelings. My question to you is, where do you think those feelings come from? And that goes <laughs> to your question. And, and we say, well, I'm willing to tell you what I think, but I'd like to know where you think they come from first. <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, okay, fine. But, but maybe it's important to you to know. Maybe it's not important to know. But the important thing is you're true to the fact that you can't deny that you've been in situations where you've lived true or false to some moral sense, some moral feeling, some prompting, we might, might say. And so when people ask that question, we're, we're trying to be respectful of a landscape in the public domain uh, that, that we don't want to give people a stumbling block if they're asking that question challengingly, hostily, or, or whatever. We, we, we want to be able to, to acknowledge the human condition in a universal way and give people the freedom to say, well, for me, it comes from Christ. We, we were not in our education project, but in working with the National Council for Adoption, where we were training social workers, we were working with an awfully lot of adoption agencies who were religiously based, Lutheran, Catholic, Protestant, Mormon, what have you, Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, and, and by the way, it's, it's, um, I don't think it's accidental that the vast majority of private adoption agencies have a religious foundation to them and, and are sponsored, some of them are directly sponsored by churches, but in any event, we were doing training in Atlanta and we were in the mall during a break, the, the lunch period, and, and some folks came up to us and said, boy, what you're teaching is, is so, well, it's so in line with our religious beliefs also. And we said, well, we're grateful for that because we think, and they said, do you mind us asking what denomination you are? And we said, well, we're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and they had a look of confusion on their faces. And so we said, well, you would know them as Mormons. And at that point, their faces fell and the frowns appeared. They could not imagine, talk about cognitive dissonance. They couldn't imagine that what we were teaching was consistent with that cult out west, okay? So we're always educating, we're always trying to keep the door open. And, and the vehicle of that is being respectful of who they are, irrespective of what their sensibility is about who you are. So, um, 
I, I think the way we live and, and the way we are willing to be open to other people's understanding of where those feelings come from makes the question almost moot since we're, trying, we're worried about lived experience and how it shows up and we're grateful for people's private lives being broad enough in their sowing charity to all men that they can accept it whether it's from Lincoln or Jefferson or even Habermas uh, or a Mormon. Uh, we, we are inviting people to see possibilities but most importantly to be true to their moral sense that is undeniable irrespective of what the source might be. Good. Just one, one quick comment, I, and President Holland talked about this, but I just wanted to put it in bold relief if I can. If I distort it, stop me, but. I will. Um, the, uh, we, the, there's a phrase these days that says, we're in a post-Christian world. Hmm. And it's easy to read that phrase religiously. Denominations are shrinking and nobody takes Christ seriously. But beyond that, there's a meaning of Christianity that I think is the meaning John Adams had and, and the other founders had that, uh, that grounds the moral positions that, that we are identifying as essential to civic virtue. Uh, the notion of individual responsibility to a God, a sympathetic one. Uh, responsibility to love and care for one another. And, and we could make lists of other Christian principles that uniquely arose within the Judeo-Christian tradition. And it's those principles that form the foundation for the civic virtue that we're talking about and the, the rescuing of that civic virtue. And so you can talk about these Christian principles in, in, a, in a way that does not lead to any particular denomination or prescribe a, con a public confession or any particular recognition of religious authority. But you can say, well, if, if you don't want Christianity in the mix, then you don't want any sense of a purpose higher than ourselves. You don't want any sense of duty to, to something larger than ourselves. You don't want a grounding for ethics beyond simple hedonism and self-fulfillment. So those principles of Christianity can be inserted into the, con into the conversation as Christianity if we just sort of unbaptize it and take off the vest vestitures uh, of, of a particular Christian church. It, it's those ideas that are at the core. And then later on we'll see where that leads people. But one could be a Christian nation under those auspices without a particular religious profession. You, you want to fix that, President? No, no. That's a good, <laughs> good note to end on. Okay. Thank you. We'd certainly love to continue, but we want to respect everyone's time. And uh, so we'd like to give a round of applause and appreciation.